Lepke's gang ballooned to nearly 500. He trained his men in the newly created art of the Union shakedown. Lepke used his expanded legion of enforcers to threaten manufacturers as well. If they wanted to ship even a yard of fabric, they would pay him by the pound. The price for violating Lepke's demands was steep. For example, if a manufacturer was not coming across with the money that Lepke expected, he might burn his place down as an object lesson to other recalcitrant manufacturers. He might sabotage pieces of equipment. He might pour acid on the cloth that was to be cut up and made into garments. He had a variety of ways, some uh, subtle, some completely unsubtle, for exercising his uh, control. By 1929, at the age of 32, Lepke was a millionaire. He moved out of the boarding house where he had lived off and on since he was 15 and bought a building in Queens. But it wasn't enough. He would not be satisfied until he controlled the entire garment workers union. Then he found another weak link. The Cutters. 1,800 men and women responsible for creating the patterns needed for mass manufacturing. If they didn't work, the entire industry would shut down. Lepke did not need to use violence to take over the cutters, just a clever deal. He knew the cutters were tired of being treated like stepchildren by the union leadership. He was also aware that they were unhappy with their new union contracts. So he sent his partner Gara to approach the small but valuable local. The intimidating Gara offered the gang strong-arm services to show the manufacturers and the union just how much the cutters were needed. The cutters took the deal. They sort of sold their souls and their power, and now he had the cutters union and he had the truckers, and so that meant you couldn't make a suit and you couldn't ship a suit without them. Lepke's success put him at odds with Amalgamated Clothing Workers President Sidney Hillman. Hillman had known about Lepke and Gara's presence for a long time, but he had 50,000 members to lead and quietly tolerated the gangsters, relying on Lepke to stabilize the small but vocal parts of the union. At various times, Lepke was doing the work of the union, so it's conceivable that at various times Hillman was prepared to look the other way, uh, either because he felt he couldn't do anything about it or because he felt for the time it was best not to. They would never be caught dead in a room with him. But they had to do business with him because he, he had the unions. He had the strength to kill everybody off, you know. Sidney Hillman had to deal with them. I'm not saying he was purposely corrupt, but he had to deal with them. He may not have taken money from them, I don't know, but he had to deal with them. By 1931, Lepke was restless again. He wanted to diversify. So he took the technique that helped him dominate the clothing trade and turned to a new target, bakery truckers. These 150 drivers brought fresh bread, rolls, and cookies to the bakeries of New York City. They also raked in thousands of dollars in profits. Lepke didn't have the time or the patience to negotiate with these truckers. He just wanted their money. His men simply came into their union headquarters with guns drawn and opened fire. When the shooting was over, a dozen were dead, and Lepke had another union under his belt. What ends up happening is people who buy food or have to utilize these services end up paying more and more all the time because the owners and the unions and all those involved in the various aspects of the labor world are paying a cut to Lepke Bookhalter. They had their hands in every till. They had it in the garment center, they had it in the eggs, they had it, you know, at the bakery business. They were making moo-boo bucks. His racketeering success brought him to the forefront of established Jewish gangsters in America who were just beginning to join forces with a fast-growing Italian mob. To put Lepke in, in perspective, you know, you, you, when you talk about Jewish gangsters and Lepke, you're really talking about, at the time, the dominant force in crime were Jewish gangsters. The biggest mobsters were Long Beach women in New Jersey, Lepke in New York. They called it the combination. That was the combination. Later on, through Lansky's intervention and others, they brought in the young Italian mobsters, the young mafiosis like Luciano. Meyer Lansky, a pal from Lepke's days with bootlegger Arnold Rothstein, introduced him to Charles Lucky Luciano late in 1931. Lansky thought the successful Lepke would make a good addition to a newly formed syndicate, a board of directors of organized crime. Luciano looked at him and he said, what the hell kind of name is Lepke? He says, look, uh, that's the name that my mother called me when I was a kid. 
and I kind of like it. And my friends call me Lepke. So Luciano laughed when he told the story. He says, he says after that, he said, uh, how the hell can you not like someone who thinks about his mother all the time? Now, the 34-year-old Lepke had all he ever wanted, a place of honor in the upper ranks of organized crime and a booming racketeering enterprise that was making him a fortune. On the horizon, a quiet storm was building in the form of a lawman who was watching Lepke's every move. In the 1930s, Lepke Bookalter was one of the most powerful crime bosses in America. He used murder and extortion to rule critical parts of many New York labor unions, and his power seemed limitless. It wasn't just the garment industry, everything that was running in New York, everything that, was, that had to do with, with unions and workers, he would get involved in. If you could control the unions, you can shut down a city, literally. Lucky Luciano said that one time. He said, with us, it was gambling, it was booze, it was uh, whores. He says, with Le Lepke, he says, he steals the bread out of the worker's mouth, meaning that that was his area, basically, and he controlled it. As Lepke's criminal enterprises were thriving, he was reunited with his beloved mother, who moved back to New York from Colorado and remarried. Knowing that most of the workers whom her son was exploiting were Jews, she gave him a warning. If he didn't give money to the synagogue, I would do this to him. The money that Lepke makes by beating up and killing Jews in the garment industry, he then gives some of that to his mother's synagogue. He also shared his wealth with his older siblings, whom he barely knew, most having moved out when Lepke was still a child. He regularly sent money to his brother, now a rabbi in Denver, and helped to put another brother through dental school at New York University. He only wanted good for his brothers and sisters, and from his doing, his brothers and sisters became great achievers. Even though he was now as rich as any railroad tycoon or oil baron, Lepke kept his lifestyle simple and out of public view. He never drank or gambled. His only vice were the cigars he chain-smoked from morning until night. In December 1930, he moved to an upscale apartment on Manhattan's Central Park West, and he fell in love. Beatrice Betty Wasserman was born in England in 1902. Her working-class parents brought her to America in 1910 and struggled to send their only daughter to fashionable private schools and give her music lessons. Lepke and Betty met at a dinner party. He took one look at her brown eyes and was hooked for life. She was beautiful, Betty, gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful woman. You know, he was a quiet, very classy guy, and she was, you know, she was just like him in that sense. She was very well-spoken, you know, she's a very, very classy lady. Like his mother, Betty was a widow. She also had a nine-year-old son, Harold. After a five-month courtship, Lepke married her and adopted the boy in March 1931. And this changed his life, at least his personal life, to a great degree. You could say for the first time now, or for, and I won't say the first time, but after many, many years, he has a family situation. Wife, child, home. His partner, Garaj Shapiro, also married and began a family. He and Lepke agreed their legacy would not be passed down to the next generation. They wanted their children to be successful, but on the right side of the law. Even though my grandfather was like a millionaire and he did, did, did a lot of bad things to people, but he wanted better for his children. He didn't want his children to suffer, either did Lepke. They established good values in their children, believe it or not. And as many of these Jewish mobsters, most of these Jewish mobsters, he kept the family totally uninvolved and outside of his quote-unquote business activities. They did not know what he was doing. To them, he was a businessman. New York authorities were not so easily fooled. Late in 1935, Lepke began receiving strange phone calls at his headquarters in the Empire State Building. The anonymous callers would ask about intricate details of his union deals. He slammed down the phone angrily each time they called. In December, subpoenas began arriving. A New York City special prosecutor named Thomas E. Dewey was going after Lepke's empire. I think it's true that, uh, that Dewey was interested in going after Lepke because he could establish that uh, uh, Lepke's uh, power 
affected ordinary people's lives. Lepke watched as Dewey's battery of accountants seized bank books, ledgers, and financial statements. This was the most serious challenge yet to his authority and to the fragile privacy he craved at home. Lepke's a family man. This is becoming very disturbing. You know, you keep your family out of it, but if you're followed, if your phones are tapped, if people are... There's no way of hiding it. He met his associates and had to give orders. He met them in, in, in bathrooms. He began to meet them on the subway where there were lots of people around and noise. There was, he had no peace. The thought of Dewey's men catching him made Lepke crazy. On his way to dinner one evening early in 1936, Lepke approached a newsstand. In the New York Times, he saw a mugshot from his prison term at Sing Sing next to a picture of a smiling Dewey, enraged. He ordered the stand torched later that night. For Lepke, Dewey's pressure was too much. He had a wife and son to think about. It was time to take deadly action. He planned nothing less than a murder spree to kill every witness who might testify against him. The worst in mob history, lasting for nearly three years. Before it ended, more than 30 people were killed. To carry out the hits, he turned to his friend, Mendy Weiss, and a loosely formed group of contract killers known in the press as Murder Incorporated. There are a lot of people who think that Murder Incorporated was Lepke's invention. It was not invented by nor run by uh, Lepke, though he often is called the head of Murder Incorporated. He was just their number one client. Their first target was not a labor kingpin or a mob crony, but a wily truck driver with a big mouth. Joseph Rosen was a trucker who was one of those truckers who did not want to go along with the Lepke scheme of things, did not want to pay tribute to Lepke. Lepke kept upping the ante trying to drive Rosen out of business, which eventually succeeded in doing. Rosen, the father of five, finally agreed to pay Lepke tribute if he would help him find a new job. Lepke agreed, and in a rare show of compassion, wrote a check for $1,000 to Rosen to help feed his family. But Rosen became angry as months went by with no word from Lepke about a job. Rosen announced to one of Lepke's soldiers that he would go to Dewey and tell the prosecutor what he knew about Lepke's racket. When Lepke found out about Rosen's threat, in front of Gara and several top associates, he angrily ordered Rosen killed. By this point, Rosen had quit the trucking business and opened a small candy store in Brooklyn. On an early Sunday morning in October 1936, as he opened up, he was greeted by 16 bullets. If Lepke thought that killing this one former trucker would solve his problems, he was mistaken. In September 1937, he learned that Prosecutor Dewey was planning to indict him and his partner Gura for racketeering. Lepke knew there was only one way out. In October, he left a terse note for his wife saying only, I'm away on business. We'll contact you soon. Love, Lou. Then he, along with his loyal partner, Gara, disappeared. New York and federal authorities now launched a worldwide manhunt for the two racketeers, but they were looking in all the wrong places. In October 1937, the king of the labor rackets, Lepke Bookalter, abandoned his family and went underground rather than face criminal charges from prosecutor Tom Dewey. In hiding, Lepke kept on issuing frantic orders to eliminate his enemies. Anybody who he felt was giving him a tough time, he said, well, get rid of him, kill him, get rid of him, hit him. You know, and and it, it became this, this kind of losing control, which was not like Lepke. Lepke's loyal pal, Gara Shapiro, joined him in hiding.